welcome to Arizona Laughs and Listings, the podcast where fun and funny folks get together and talk about real estate and comedy, two completely unrelated topics that go surprisingly well together. I'm your host, Kristen LeVanway, a real estate agent here in the Phoenix metro area for 19 years, as well as a local stand-up comedian. My guest today is not only a very funny comedian, but she has cracked the code on cheap travel and I can't wait to hear how she does it. I'm super excited to welcome Lee Cummings. Yes, it's Lee Cummings. It's, it's really her. (laughs) Hello, Lee. Hi there. Welcome to my podcast. Thank you for having me. It's funny that I'm having like these great conversations with my comedy friends, but I've had to do it this way because it's so hard to pin everybody down, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Very true. And I am not in town a lot, so I'm glad we made this yes. happen. Tell us a little bit about that. Where Where is it that you're going, Lee Cummings? Okay, so I do stand-up comedy. I have a day job like we all do, but I throw in a little piece because I'm single, never married, and no kids. Why would I want to sit in Phoenix, Arizona all the time? So I found a way to travel for cheap. So I pet sit and you're like, okay, like Rover. No, 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 no. We don't go Rover. We do. It's called trusted house sitter. And it's like dating profiles for pet sitters. So they post their house and try to sell their house. Like they try to make it seem fancy and clean. And like their pets are so easy to take care of. And then I have a profile too with reviews and I just go all around the, all over the place. So we can get into all of that, but that's what I do. So that, because lodging is the biggest expense when you travel, let's make it free. Yes. That's cool. So they're actually selling their pet to you. Like, please come and watch my dog. Yes. That's because I don't, that's... I don't get paid. So they're, they're, I pick the nicest house, the easiest pets, the like best location. That sounds amazing. Okay. We'll get, we'll get into that more later. Uh, what else? What else does what else do is, does no one know about Lee Cummings that we should know about? Oh my gosh, there's probably so much. But what am I willing to share? No, um, <laughs> exactly. To no, I've been doing. Stand-up, I think we're at 11 years right now, and it's funny. I submitted my profile to one of the local comedy clubs to update my my profile, my bio. That's the right word. Uh-huh. And it said I've been doing comedy for over a decade. Am I that good? No. But it doesn't change the facts. But are you having fun? I mean, that's really the most important question if you ask me. I right? love to perform. No, don't get me wrong. I love to be on stage. I love to perform. I love, you know, we all say we were there to make other people laugh and forget about their problems for a short time. But there's a lot that comes with it, as we know. So the positive, love it, love performing. But there's a lot that comes with it. It is, yes. It's actually work. I mean, you don't have to work, but you will suck if you do not work at it. That is evident at any open mic. (laughs) (laughs) But wait, you say that those are the ones that are like working it, right? They're trying. They're the ones. That's true. But you can tell when people are going to a mic and they're working on new material and maybe it's not that funny, but you can see you, you, it will be. But the ones that just show up and they just like, F bomb, F bomb. You know, those are the ones that you're like, okay. So I, you know, I, you're saying, I think there are two different type of people that go to open mics. Those that are looking to perfect a craft, make their jokes strong. And those that are using it to just have the opportunity to say the most vile things to whoever will listen. And I get the social side of it because well, it is fun and they're fun people. So there's that, you know, I mean, it's, you're getting something out of it. I guess that's good, but it's a range. Let's just say that it's a range. It's a range. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you're here. We have like a, a a fun little format that I've been doing. So our first segment, I like to call your firsts. And so we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna ask you about your first house and your first comedy show. And you can start whichever way you like. Okay. So first house, I was like on track with life, like you know, graduated high school in the top of my class, went to college at NAU with honors. Next step was buy a house, right? When you graduate college, buy a house. My sister and I, I'm a triplet, by the way. So one of my triplet sisters and I, at 24 years old, we had like been in the work market for a few years, 
decided to buy a house in 2001. So January, 2001, we bought a house in Ahwatukee, old Ahwatukee. And with the thought that, you know, we'd live there for like five years as an investment. And then we'd like go our separate ways. Someone would get married. 23 years later, we're still in the house together. Okay. The I'm same gonna, house. The house together. <laughs> but it has appreciated. So there's- I would hope so. After 23 years. Yes, it has. But it was a nightmare. So we went to this. We were just out driving by ourselves. We didn't have a realtor. We pulled up to this home. There, the realtor was inside. He was just leaving. So he showed us the house and we were like, we'll take it that day. And he's like, uh, you don't have a realtor. Um, he opened the phone book because it was a long time ago. And he said, pick anyone. I'm sure anyone you call will be willing to represent you. And oh, we're like, wow. no, we trust you. So he represented both of us. And long story short, he, can I say dicked us over a little bit, but it was you a hard. You can totally say that. It's a very good, le- it's very timely, which we'll, we'll talk about later. Yeah. <laughs> and he tried. So like, you I, were I, I basically unrepresented. Like, you seem like a decent dude. Well, you know, but no, no, his, he had the seller's interest at heart. Shocker. 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 <laughs> He wasn't looking out for you guys? No, no. In the end, it all worked out, but. Did it? Yeah, it was hard at the time. What was the hardest part of it? Like, where do you think that he could have done a better job or things would have gone better had you had your own agent? He at one point threatened to like just drop the whole deal and like sue us because he want they wanted to stay. They wanted to close on the house, but they wanted to stay for like another two or three weeks to like get their stuff out. And so now at this point, we're like reaching out to other realtors. Like, is this normal? Is this okay? Like we would technically be liable for anything that happened in the house over those two weeks and blah, blah, blah. And we were like, no, we're not doing this. Once, once it closes, we want you out. And he's like, I'm going to sue you guys. Wow. And you're just like 24 year old buying your first house. You're like, come on, man. Be nice. Wow. That's it all worked out. But lessons learned. Get a realtor you trust. It does help because those, that does come up, that whole occupancy possession deal. And it's possible to work those deals out, but you want somebody who's looking out for your interests, who's going to make sure like if they flood the house or burn it down, that you now don't own an empty lot <laughs> with a, like a campfire in the middle of it, you know? And it was the same thing, like, cause all their stuff was still in the house. Obviously they lived in the house up until it closed. So like, we didn't even know if there were holes in the walls or big holes in the floor under the couch or, I mean, just things we didn't even know. So you guys didn't do it like a home inspection and all that stuff stuff was still in it. Oh man. That sounds horrible. That sounds horrible. Get it. Yes. It's a very good lesson of what happens. He he, he recommended the home inspector. Oh, so it's his guy. We we couldn't win to lose. So. Right. And yeah. Full, I take full responsibility for being stupid. Yeah. Well, the first one's the hardest, you know, but, um, but obviously that's probably a first and last because at this point, I mean, 23 <laughs> years, you might as well just stay. Not leaving. I'm not exactly. leaving. Well, they, there was a TikTok someone did that said, if you were to leave with the interest rates, what they were then and try to buy something like a hundred thousand dollars more than what your home is worth, you would be still be paying almost double the actual mortgage payment. Even well, just, if you uh, bought your house 23 years ago, and I'm not going to be nosy, but I mean, your payment must be, let's just say, quite affordable. Affordable, yes. <laughs> yeah, I would think so. a one-bedroom apartment now, for sure, for a three-bedroom. If you're lucky. If you're lucky. It's crazy. Well, so that was your first house, and maybe last. Yeah. <laughs> what about your first comedy show? Okay, so 11 years ago, I decided... The short version is this is how I got into comedy. I'll just give that quick story. I'd gone on this camp out. It was a girl guy camp out from like a church activity. And we get out of the car with this group of girls. Uh, everyone runs up and they were like, oh, Larissa, you're so beautiful. And they're like, Stacy, you're so spiritual. And I stood there like people like I was non-existent to these people. And I, so I stopped and I was like, what am I? And they go, well, you're funny. 
And I was like, well, I better do something with this. So I had been going to the Tempe Improv every Thursday night because I had a t-shirt and you got on free on Thursdays if you wore a Tempe oh. Improv t-shirt and I'm cheap. So I would get my half order of nacho, wear my Tempe Improv t-shirt. And one day on the table, it said a flyer. Do you think you're funny? And I was like, yes. So I took comedy school with comedyschools.com. That's how, that was my first um, time doing comedy. So I had done the intro wow. session. I did the advanced course, which comes with a performance. And it was at Tempe Center for the Arts. And it was on there. They're still stage. doing it there. Yep. They're, they're still doing it at Tempe Center of the Arts. But it wasn't in the lakeside. So it was in the bigger stage room. So it was this huge stage with like theater seating. And it was, that was my first time doing stand up. Wow. How did it feel to get up on the stage the first time? And it was a big stage. Big stage. And I swear, I almost backed out. Like it was like that week of, I was like, I can't do this. I'm not, I'm not doing this. Like I'm not ready. I can't do this. No one's going to laugh, but you invite your friends and everyone there is there for newbies. So it all worked out. It all worked out. But yeah, it was, I literally was like, I'm not doing this. I'm not going out there. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. <laughs> but you got laughs. Of course. I've been telling that same Oompa Loompa joke for a decade. The Oompa Loompa joke was one of your originals? Oh, it's a classic. I mean, I've added and in you know, like, like um, they keep remaking something. that movie so it will continue to be relevant. I think they've right. had at least two major motion additional movies of Willy Wonka since then. They'll just, <laughs> it'll just keep renewing that joke for you. Thanks, guys. That's awesome. So you did the first and you were terrified. So did you come off the stage and go, I'm perfect? Or did you come up going, oh no, you, I mean, you know, you come off the stage and like, it's a high. People laugh, mm -hmm. people had a good time, and you're like, this feels amazing. I want to chase this feeling. Yes, yes, it's true. Of course, then you go out again and <laughs> you, because you, it seems like everybody starts off and you and you start off well. Otherwise, you don't do it again. True. And then you go out and you know maybe you you try some new jokes or whatever. And and it seems like everybody has a lull then, where you're just bombing every single time. But I think it's kind of part of the deal. You have to learn how to bomb so that you can get better. Am I? Is that? Do you think? Do you think I'm just making that up. Scary. Oh no, you're right. You're right. It is necessary, but golly how I'm like it, it but it blows my mind I could do the same set as two nights earlier and completely bomb that people were going wild for two nights earlier like the exact same set it's just it's like hot and cold <laughs> it's weird but as soon as you figure that out and then you stop taking it personally I think I mean it still sucks Wait. but you're like eh, okay <laughs> I'll just do it again tomorrow it'll be fine right again tomorrow yeah. And I think after a while you get jokes that you know are going to mostly land. So then you just figure at least people, they just need to drink more or something. They've just, they're just a bunch of wet blankets. Come on. That's a funny joke. That is, we'll throw this in. Doing clean shows makes it harder where they're not drunk. They're not yeah. super spicy. Like you have to like edit things in your head and yeah. To, sometimes doing like the clean clean shows gives me the most anxiety like I don't curse that much it's not like a big deal to me that's not my but sometimes you're just like the restrictions yes if, if you're worried if I cry you know that was an innuendo but was it too much was it too there or yeah so I do the Jared's open mic um Saturday's clean Thursday we call it the dirty mic I like to call it the expressive mic because you don't have to swear, but you can if you want to. And so one of the younger comedians came up. He's very, very funny, but he's very, very spicy. And he was telling this dirty joke. And I look over, and this little kid had walked into the room. I was like, oh. And he's the comedian just like, oh. <laughs> and I had to go out and find the kid's mom. And I said, are you here with somebody? And the kid's like, it's OK. They don't mind. It's like, oh, I think they do. <laughs> I had to go get his mom. Because it is different. The mom said he's She's fine. like, you get out of there. You can't be <laughs> listening to that. <laughs> it's a coffee shop. It was like, not okay. It was not okay. But it was funny. But it did. It threw him off after that. 
I said, just start all over. Just, we're just going to reset it to zero. You just start all again because it freaked them out. <laughs> it's funny. All right. So First House first comedy show. And obviously, you've done many comedy shows since then, over 11 years. Yeah. <laughs> Still enjoying it. Uh, so that, that brings us to our next segment, which I like to call your favorite rooms. So I would love to hear what your favorite room to perform is and your favorite room in your house, but maybe not necessarily your house. Could be someone else's house. Okay. I didn't know it was favorite room to perform in. Let me think about that question. Where's my favorite place I like to perform? What What is yours? I need, I need a hint. Let me think. Well, obviously I like Jared's because I'm there all the time. Uh, Stir Crazy was very fun. The Grill 61. I have been there a few times and every time the audience is very fun. They are, they are there for a good time. And it's not really a comedy club. It's a golf course clubhouse and then 55 plus community. But those guys are there for, they, they're lively. And okay. that's really fun when it's a really engaged audience. I think I'm going to agree with you that Grill 61, that was my third time there. And the first two and the third, I mean, they all were great. But like after, I think the second time I performed there, some of these men were like, I'm taking you home. And it was just so fun, <laughs> like in a fun way. They were like, yeah, yeah. Like what you're doing. And they were like, kind of being flirty. Like, but you're right. Those people were there. They paid money to watch comedy. They wanted to drink. And they were having a good time. No restrictions on what we could say. We could say anything. It was beautiful. And, beautiful. you know, sometimes in a club or especially if it's a bar show, it's a kind of a ne negative vibe from the audience. Like there's some, there's some people that are just, they just put out negative energy. And I've never seen that there. It's all positive. Even some of the people that maybe don't get the jokes, you know, they're just like, it's just fun. Like no one's gonna heckle you it's not really heckling it's more like we're having fun and we want to be part of the conversation it's a little bit different but i think you're right because most of those people all know each other like so it's like a room full of i don't know how many people were there 60 people that all kind of know each other and are there for the same purpose having a good time with the intent to have a good time with each other so yeah there's something beautiful there that's true because you know sometimes a joke or a comedian will talk to an audience, you know, you're trying to work in the crowd a little bit or a joke lands with somebody and they maybe know that person. And so that's even part of it. Like normally in a comedy club, you don't know the person who the comedian is making fun of their, their shirt or whatever, you know, but in that room, they do probably. There's history. And they're probably going to talk about it later. Like the next day on the golf course. Ah, that was so funny when he said that to you. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. A good one. It's a good one. Good room. Thanks, Chris. It is. It's a good room. Okay. What about the house room? I do want to hear about your favorite room in your house, but also the favorite room. And tell us a little bit more about your pet sitting. Like, was there okay. a room in the that you're just like, I wish I could live here forever? Yes. So I'll just throw out some of the pet sits that I've done that have been kind of like more fun. I got to do two weeks in St. Thomas Virgin Islands. And so oh they let me use their car. So I just had to provide airfare. So I flew there. I got two weeks in the Virgin islands. They let my friend come stay with me for a week. And so she would drive me around, <clears throat> excuse me. So from a location standpoint, that was amazing. But I mean, things are so expensive there. That was like a tiny little house. It was like a one bedroom house with a kitchen. So room wise, that's not there. Um, but I was just kind of giving a background of places that I go are usually where I can drive within an eight hour radius from Phoenix Metro. So I do a lot oh, in Durango, Santa Barbara, San Diego. Um, what direction else? All beautiful places. Yeah. I, I like the water. Why not? I just did two weeks in Pismo Beach. But I'm trying to think of like my favorite room. It's usually outside. Oh, Carlsbad in San Diego. Okay. They had the most beautiful backyard. It didn't see the ocean. Oh. Like you can see the ocean from there. You could oh. see the ocean when I did one in Cabo from the living Cabo. Room. Wow. What's the name of this uh, pet sitting <laughs> website again? Yes. It's called Trusted House Sitters. We'll post my link so I get credit for it. As people sign up here. This is my link. At least give me a free month. Oh, oh yeah. I'll definitely, I'll put it in the description when I post funny. this all up. Somebody give yes. me 
free month on the website. That would be, yeah, it sounds amazing. What a great idea. Yeah. So I don't like to be in Phoenix in the summertime. So I pick places I can still, because I work a day job. I work 100% remote. I set up outside. I bring my own table, my own chair, my own monitor. Like I set up at these people's house outside. And that's why I go back to Santa Barbara a lot. These people, I think I'm on my fourth or fifth time. They now invite me back whenever they go on vacation. But it's a beautiful view. It's I, I'll send it to you. I'll, we'll post the view. You can see a little bit of the water, but it's just trees and the weather's amazing. Wow. And I get to sit outside in the middle of the summer. So Santa Barbara's nice. I went to college there for a year and a half. You see Santa Barbara? Did you really? Are you? Do you know where the university is? I just got a parking ticket at the university. Yes. <laughs> so I went there in uh, eighty one. I was there from 81 to 83. That's when I moved here. It was January of 83. And it was, I don't know if it's still this way, but it was a throwback to the 70s. Like it was, it was like a time capsule. The the Isla Vista where the campus is. I went back and visited and it it has changed some as everything does, especially in California because, you know, an outhouse is a million dollars in Santa Barbara. Yes. Yes. But like it was really like a cool million dollar home. You're like, this is a $3 million home. Like what we used to consider a million dollar home was something special. And now homes here are a million dollars and it's nothing special. So it's hard to yes. even see like a value of things because of what's happened in the last few years. But yeah, blah, 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 blah. It's true. A million dollars just doesn't get you very far anymore. Doesn't get you. Away. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what it used to be. <laughs> No, but you know what? That's the nice thing though, about since you have your home it, and it doesn't, you don't really care how much it's worth. Right. I mean, it's I affordable. You don't have to be out there slugging it out with people trying to, to get one of these houses, you know, the, the rare five or $600,000 house. That's like the regular house now. Cause you're good. I'm good. I'm good. That's, I think it's, if you can think about real estate as, as a long game, it really does change the game a lot. Just. But you say that you know. and we're, we're agreeing that like in my mind now, I'm like, yes, I will always have a place to live. But I would say 10, 15 years ago, I felt like this home was a, what is that? A ball and chain on my ankle because I wanted to really? go and I didn't have this pet sitting. I wanted to just go be free. I wanted to go somewhere for a month and not worry about it. But I'm like, well, what do I do with this house? I don't want to sell, you know, the market dropped and whatever year that was, uh-huh. it was worth nothing. And right. Yeah. Cause this would have been around the crash time when you were having this epiphany. Yes. So I was like, now the you, house so you came up with a solution. The universe did not just using. Yes. I found a good solution. I don't, I still need to go like overseas. Like I want to go spend a month in Italy pet sitting while still keeping my day job like, or like Spain or somewhere, like make it magical. That, ah, that's just so cool. So what, does your sister still live there with you? Yeah. So you don't have to worry about the house while you're gone and somebody's taking care of it. Yes. That's, that's like the perfect situation. It's the best of all worlds. Cause people ask, don't you have pets? And I was like, yes, I have a cat. And they're like, well, how do you pet sit? I have a roommate takes care of my cat when I'm gone that's a that's the best life ever (laughs) so you have total freedom just like you wanted that's that's all I freedom like when I totally off story I hit a deer on one of the pet sits in Durango and it totaled my car and like that loss of freedom of being in a unknown place I couldn't I couldn't go anywhere I, I was in Bayfield if you guys know the area so it was like 20 minutes outside of Durango there wasn't Uber out there. Like I was stranded and that loss of freedom, like played with my mind, just being like stuck and stranded. The ball and chain was for real. Yes. I was like, I need freedom in my life. That's why I'm single, never married. You know, I think that's not uh, as rare as it used to be. And I also think there's less of a stigma about it. You know, it used to be, I was just telling my, my son yesterday, uh, I got married in the British Virgin Islands like a million years ago. I'm not married anymore, but got married in the British Virgin Islands. And so in the marriage license, and I was, I was 30, 30 when I got married. 
and they list you as a spinster. <laughs> That's just the term they use. Of a married like, woman? I don't feel like a spinster, but you know, that's what they call you. And, and and in that time period, I think if you were married, you were not married. And especially if you were getting in your thirties, forties, and you're like, I don't think I'm going to get married. I think there was a certain stigma to it, a social stigma, but I don't think that's the case anymore. I think it's loosened. I would say it's not gone. There is still definitely a stigma in religious circles after you hit 30 and you know, religions that focus on family and marriage. Oh yeah. I, I am definitely feel that. Do I like, do I think that about myself? No, but I definitely feel it from outside. Yeah, that's true. I think there's always somebody who wants to judge you and make you feel like you're whatever. You're not meeting the standards with, with anything. It could be anything, it, your marital status, your, your house, your, you know, what size pants you wear, whatever, you know, they want to pick on you for every reason. But I think there's more acceptance now as well. I so agree. you just got to ignore those hater judgy people. They want freedom and they can't have it. <laughs> I think too, it's just a sign that if they're judging you, it's a sign of their own insecurities. So you could even just tell yourself, well, I hope things go better for you in your life. <laughs> That's way so too you mature. don't need to go after other people. You know what I mean? I agree. Like some people are, you know, are miserable in their marriage, but then like judge you for being single. That's a yeah. better way to put it. You're like, they're actually just envious. They just wish yeah. they were in the I same mean, boat. You chose wrong. Okay. Just because I had some and I threw them back and you decided to put a ring on it. That's on you. And what's worse too, uh, never getting married or marrying like, it's like four different loser guys which is the better way to go which is the I'd better way to go it's cheaper to never get married <laughs> to get married four times I mean, I guess and divorce really love weddings well even the weddings of the weddings cost money but the divorces do too right i don't know i mean yes they do but don't women yeah. usually at least they used to make out in the end of some divorces yeah maybe Sometimes. I mean, now, yeah, if you throw kids in the mix, that's a whole other story. That's true. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I think you should just do whatever you want. That's, seems to be the best way to go. Truth. For sure. And I have heard that if people are insulting you, the best response is to say to them, are you okay? <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> Does that make you feel better? Like, are you okay? Yeah. Really? Maybe you should go talk to somebody. I don't know. <laughs> yes, I am 46, never married, no kids. I know. Are you going to be okay with this information you've learned? Right? Yeah. I hope so. I'll I'll pray for you, even though I don't ever pray for anybody. I'll pray for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll be like, would you, since you're so close, pray for me to send me this magical man I probably won't end up marrying, but just keep him nearby. Yes. 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 I could use a boy toy <laughs> a little to play with like a cat. Right. I mean, a cat's much easier when you really get down to it. I mean, and, and even easier than a dog when you get right down to it, you know? Oh, so when I pet sit, I'll say 80% of the time, I mean, I purposely choose cats. They're just easier. Let's be real. I want to go explore on my off time. So I don't want to be walking your, okay. Some lady made me walk. She had two chihuahuas. Walk the chihuahuas, I think like half a mile, three times a day. I was like, the, the, the legs on the dog. Like, I don't think the dog needs that much exercise. Like, it can walk to the back patio and would be just out of breath. So, Aww. funny. Pet sitting, like pet sitting parents, some of them are hilarious. I bet. Because I don't want to sound, I shouldn't even probably say this, but I'm going to. Because I'm a dog person and I'm thinking to myself, who would hire a pet sitter for a cat? But like, you can't you just leave a big bowl of food and a big bowl of water? I you just leave? for at least two weeks. So, I mean, like, you got to refresh that food. But oh, yeah, that's true. Every two day weeks. You litter, right? You just water. Yeah, that's food. true. And it's just someone at your house. Some people will even hire a pet sitter with no pets, just so there's a car in the driveway, uh, lights go on and off, because that is what I wanted to talk to you about. These TikToks that I'm seeing about squatters. Well, let's Are move on. 
real estate rundown. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> what is going so on? Squatters. With rights? What's up with that? Oh, I don't know. I'm watching these TikToks that says, I nah, don't quote me. I thought you would know. Um, someone, if, if they find out you're on vacation, people break into your house. If they're there for seven days and can prove it, apparently they have squatter rights. And like, can like wait for the court system to kick them, kick them out. So like, yeah. don't post your vacations online, people. And I was like, wait, this is me being shady. Not that I am, but like, think of like cruise people, like, I work at Carnival Cruise. I know you're going to be gone on a 14 day cruise, and I send because there's like rings of like foreigners that like go and do this squat into these. I got to stop you there for a second. You work for Carnival? No, no, no. I said say you did. No, I don't. Oh, okay. He's like, you can see the talk about that afterwards. I love that 14 day cruise. Like you tell you, you you tell your friends that are foreigner foreign ring. And you have all their information, their address, how long they're going to be gone, blah, blah, blah. Like, (sighs) did you It's scary. Well, I'll tell you this. I know every state's different. And some states, it's much easier to to squat than others. Arizona's not one of them. Okay, good. If you're five days late in your rent, they kick you out. It's just, you know, there's like a process and you there's it's definitely more uh property owner rights here in this state so i would think it'd be harder to do that in arizona you know arizona is a little bit like the wild west still so <laughs> you know so i think in arizona i'm just saying okay TikTok squatter people just don't even try it here it will not work it will not work maybe i don't, I don't know what don't states know. would but this is not one of them for sure but I, I that seems crazy. The message um, don't tell people don't post on Facebook that you're leaving because people be crazy. I do know that you that there's some concerns about land. That you have to be careful with land because of these um people that there's a lot of title fraud now. Um where they try to take over your property through title fraud. So the vacant land is is a high risk one. You got to really watch it if you have vacant land. I don't, but I will keep that note. Where should we be buying land? Like, where's a good place? Like, if you were to be like, I recommend just so you have a homestead, a place to live. Should everything go to crap? Where should I buy mm-hmm. land? Uh, that's a good question. So I know, uh, you know, Tonopah. Like if you drive into California, hot you know, springs you know, in Tonopah. Tonopah. That's something you don't know about me. I'm a hot springs junkie. Tonopah has hot springs. Go ahead. Oh, then you should check it out because Wait, all those solar there things. is some major speculating going on out there. What's that community with all the solar panels? It's called something. Oh yeah, I just drove through it. Uh, like uh, it starts with a V. Verma something land. land. Verma land. Verma land. With an so M. there's that. <laughs> And then I think just uh, up the road a bit is Bill Gates' big, like $25,000 or 25,000 acre city of the future, future home. Of kind of thing. So there's definitely some speculation going on out there on the West side and the West side. And I mean, I'm an East sider. I like the East Valley. Uh, and we do have a bunch of development going on going East. So Apache junction is going to be a hot spot. A lot of that line's already been, it's just in Badgie Junction at the other It's true. It was rough. I know. All the jokes we make about Apache Junction, we might have to we might have to pick Coolidge or something next because it's uh but we it's get to fetch parts of Apache Junction and build new houses or something. How do they get around oh, yeah. like roughness is happening in there? So yeah, there's still the weird, you know, funky parts where you might see a mansion next to a beat up mobile home or something but there's a lot of development going on out there we so call that it's gold canyon be... i'm just kidding <laughs> like nobody yeah, wants gold to canyon. Gold canyon is going to be surrounded by houses it's gonna be crazy and then on the west side they're similar you know it's we're a sprawling community because it's all flat land and so they're just like yeah we'll just sprawl there's no water, but just keep building. The whole water thing is interesting. There's all these all these stories about how we're running out of water. 
Yeah. And and we're not because the the news people are reporting, okay, we're run, we only have like a hundred years of water left because they've sort of twisted all of it. It's really that if you're building new development, you have to show that you can provide water for the next hundred years so that we don't run out of water. And so if you're building a new community out in like say Apache Junction where they don't have water treatment plants and all that kind of stuff yet, you got to you got to build all that stuff. So we're we're in good shape with water. Isn't there a community just like north of North Scottsdale like kind of northeast of Oh yes, Rio the, Verde, which is a good example of what happens if water. Yes. It was all hauled water. Um, and and it was the city of Scottsdale was providing it, and we had the drought. And Scottsdale's like, "Hey, man, we can't be giving you this water." And I mean, I personally would not buy a house that had hauled water. I do not want to rely on like an Amazon Prime delivery van bringing my water to me. <laughs> oh, I, I prefer it to come out of a pipe from. A big old water treatment plant. But there's wells and they're even they're okay. So I don't know. Well. I don't know. It seems like there is too many Californians coming in to and not enough water for a desert. You don't you don't have I, that vibe at all? Uh you know what? I think we should keep spreading that rumor just to right. keep things <laughs> from getting out of control. So it is yeah. already so out of control. Not very much water left. Stay there's home. No water. Stay out. There's a you cannot cross over from California into right. Arizona. Okay. And we have scorpions and they're they are, and <laughs> so rattlesnakes, scorpions. Yes. And 115 degree heat. Like there's reasons you don't yes. want to there's reasons I go visit you guys, okay, Californians? Right. Yes. Yeah, don't move here. But everyone does. It's a great place to live. I mean, let's be honest. I came here to go to college in 1983. And when I first moved here, I hated it. I was like, I came from the beach. Like, that's where I grew up. And I was like, I'm not staying here. The day I graduate is the day I'm out. But it was maybe like, what, three years later? I was like, I love it here. I'm never leaving. So You're like, I can actually buy a home here. I can actually settle down here. Back then. Back then. Yeah. Back then it wasn't, It was, even California wasn't, you know, outrageous. It was pricey, but I remember um, my second cousins are the same age as my mom, and my one of my second cousins, uh, she bought a house in San Pedro, which is like Long Beach kind of area there, San Pedro. It's south of LA, and, and it's on a hill, the house she bought, and I remember my mom just going, her house was $150,000. Can you imagine somebody buying a house for $150,000? Oh, that it's like what three million now? Because oh, for sure, yeah. That area, <coughs> and, I was so probably a couple mil. I mean, it you know, it's on Are a hill. Has to Flagstaff. Uh, we had. I mean, it was a hundred fifty thousand dollar house, so obviously it was amazing. And house house like at least three bedrooms, a couple baths, like on the hill in San Pedro. Is that by mm -hmm. Rancho Calaverdes? that nearby it, it's sort of that vicinity yeah but the san pedro never gets confused for rancho palos verdes which is which is the higher end definitely rancho palos verdes okay that's what i was thinking when you said san pedro and i was like the helm is yeah. worse ah! the san pedro's got some really nice areas even though i was afraid of san pedro for a long time but you know like rough rough neighborhood um, so there's the harbors right there. And so it, you know, the harbor area was kind of rough. Um, and then there were some areas that were kind of rough. Um, when I lived there, um, it, there was like gangs were starting to form and things like that. Uh, but up in the hill, that's, you know, the gangs didn't live there. Somehow the hill kept the gangs out. They're smart enough now. They now just walk up, yeah. right? They're fine. Yeah. I mean, now there's just gangs everywhere, I think, so. You know, it's the, they don't differ, differentiate. I mean, they have them in, Gil Gilbert. in Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs> when they have gangs in Gilbert, you know things have changed. Oh my gosh, the Gilbert gangs. We won't get into that, but no, no, no. 
Mm-hmm. But uh, but yeah, it definitely you definitely want to scope out your neighborhood, and I think get to know your neighbors too. My my house, so I live in Mesa, and I don't know how many times I've heard people say, "Whatever you do, people ever told me, don't move to Mesa. You know, you'll get murdered there." It's like so dangerous. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Well, what part um, of, but people like make the claim that like we live in East Mesa. They're like, we do not claim the West side of Mesa or like central West. That's where I live. I East live right Mesa. in the place where they said you should never oh, like move to, Mesa? but it's a great neighborhood, you know? So it's, you just got to check things out. Look at the cars in the driveway. True. And if the garage doors close. That is when I, when I go to our neighborhood, I'm like, none of these garage doors close. <laughs> yeah. We don't even have garages. Most people have carports here. So everything's just, oh. here's, here it is. Here's what we have. That is so funny. You're like, we have all our stuff stored out here in the carport. Yes. Take it's it. Just, but it's a historic neighborhood. So it's kind of just funky and, you know, it's got a, it's a lot of personality. So is it still a lot of elderly people plus like like do you know what i'm saying like the original occupants of that area i assume that you're talking about was are people that are still there uh yes so my neighborhood it's interesting because there's families that are they have streets named after them they live here in this neighborhood and then their kids live here as well like they all just buy a house in this neighborhood and so i think a lot of the houses don't ever make it to the market they just get passed around (laughs) so i don't know how i got so lucky to live here um but it is i have noticed and i think this happens a lot is that there's people like you who you know bought the house when they were in their 20s and they're now they're carting them out you know to the end of life kind of thing and and then the younger families move in and i think that's kind of what's happening here is more younger families are moving in so it just transitions to a new generation i love it i don't think you you weren't saying that i'm at end of life right no you have like decades and decades to go before they haul you out of there on a gurney i know i never know how old people think i am because of this this hair color thing but like from a voice and when i had dark hair people always thought i was younger than i was but now i think people think i'm like 50s 60s so who knows Yeah, it's hard to tell people's age. Last night at the mic, one of the comedians made a joke about um, somebody being 60 and being almost dead. And I was like, hey, dude, I am 63. Uh, I am, you know, yeah, <laughs> I'm far no from death. Doctor. There's no broken hip. Like, I'm 63. I know. He came by afterwards and he goes, I thought you were only 40. I was yes. like, you're my new best friend, <laughs> mister. <laughs> I love it. All is forgiven. You're fine. Was he the one that did the nasty joke with the kid in it? Same dude? No. No, different dude. no okay. he was different. Different guy. Yeah. Uh, it's all right. Fun, so she, how, do we, how do we wrap up, girl? How do we like? Okay. And we are going to now move on to what's coming up for oh, Lee Cummings. What's coming up for Lee Cummings? Okay. So I have a couple of shows. Apparently now I only do <laughs> this like charity shows and sporadic shows. So I have a Mother's Day show coming up at Stir Crazy in May. Ooh, I have a charity show in August. I mean, these are like the good shows. And then uh-huh. as far as pet sitting, I'm going back to my family in Santa Barbara. I'm not going to tell you guys when, because I don't want anyone to like try to squat in my house. <laughs> yeah, they, Every time they go on vacay, they call me first. And I'll be like, I get first dibs on your house and your cat. So. Oh, that's neat. I'm back to Santa Barbara. You got to come on my show sometime. I have two shows. Well, no, you're not old enough for who you're calling old. Sorry. Not yet. Got a few years yeah. to go. But maybe after the summer, when you're when you're done lollygagging over there at the Southern California beaches. <laughs> Living in someone's multi-million dollar house. I'll come back to Phoenix and my little house. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, every year so far you've come back. So the chances are good. It's true. It's true. But maybe I'm going to go spend... Six months. I'm I'm increasing it. Six months in Spain. <laughs> I know that would be amazing. That's a great way to do it. And I, you would actually all those French and Italian and Spanish 
uh, what do you call a cat in in uh, Spanish? Gato. Gatos. All the gatos. That's cool. Well, this was great. I, I this was super fun. Thank you for coming on here. You are welcome. I had a great time. Thank you for having me. And I will see you around. I hope. I'll be around. I'll be around. Well, thank you, Lee Cummings, for showing us all how we can travel the world really cheap as long as we like cats and dogs. If you want some information about the Trusted House Sitter program, I've got some information in the description below. In the meantime, keep your eyes out for some of Lee Cummings' shows throughout the Metro Phoenix area. She's a really super funny. You'll have a great time. And thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next time on Arizona Laughs and Listings.